Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to ConspiracyCon. You've already heard my announcements, and at this point, we are going to introduce our first speakers. Some of you know them. Some of you uh, may know of them, of their work, of their experiences. It is an honor for me to, to get to know them, for me to introduce them to you, to have them here to share their story. Um, Mark Phillips and Kathy O'Brien have been through a lot. Uh, Kathy has had some uh, extraordinary experiences in the mind control program, and I will let them elaborate on what that is and what that means. They have authored a book called Transformation of America, keyword trance. I think most of you in this room understand what that means. Um, Mark came along and pulled her out of this situation. Um, a situation that most of us would never even want to wish on our enemies, I think. Um, and this is their story and their uphill battle to inform the public. I don't want to take any more of their time. I'm going to let Mark lay out the details. He will speak first and then bring on Kathy. So without further ado, if you'll please give a warm round of applause to Mark Phillips and Kathy O'Brien. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I can't really see that well because of the lights, but uh, uh, it's a, a welcome opportunity for Kathy and I to be out here with you all. And uh, quite honestly, this is one of our favorite parts of the world to visit. Um, how many of you in this audience, if you don't mind me asking, know that someone could control externally a mind? Wow, okay. How many of you in this, in this audience um, uh, well, understands the fact that most people in the federal prison system are in there for one charge? Most people. The most successful prosecution of any uh, particular criminal charge, this particular one puts more people in prison than anything else. Conspiracy. Conspiracy. Yes, it is a conspiracy that will get you more time in a federal prison than anything else. And more people are serving time in a prison system, in our federal prison system, because of, of uh, being uh, convicted of being involved in a conspiracy. When in fact, we that are called conspiratists in other words, persons who are exposing a conspiracy are, rela are uh, related to uh, publicly and through the medias many, many times as having some sort of um, problem in our personas or that we are lying somehow if we are exposing the very ones that are locking people up for this charge. One, one uh, point that I would like to drive home, and I'm just, I'm just here to introduce Kathy O'Brien, but I also would like to give you all one message that is deeply embedded in everything that we are and everything that we say, and that is hope. And this hope is not just based on the fact that, that uh, a few people may get out and do something. You people are doing something right now by being at this conference. This is a very, very important conference. We've got some really old friends um, who are speakers at this conference, and we're seeing a lot of faces at this conference of, uh, of the participants who we've known from other conferences. This is quite the opportunity to uh, rekindle some of those old friendships. Now, taking you back in time a bit, Adolf Hitler assigned his right-hand man, uh, Eichmann, to research the multi-generationally abusing families of Northern Europe. What Adolf Hitler 
envisioned to be the ultimate weapon was not the atomic bomb, not weapons of mass destruction. Adolf Hitler was uh, an expert at psychological warfare. Those V-2 rockets that he absolutely just pounded Great Britain with, he put whistles on them so the people would hear them coming in. And each time they heard a whistle, they knew there was going to be an explosion right afterwards. This was a very important factor to beat down the people's morale, to make them want to give up. I've often said if Adolf Hitler had had television at his fingertips, things would have been very different. The Nazis would have been indeed acquired uh, a, a very different position in history when in fact Adolf Hitler when he had uh, Eichmann and Himmler researching these multi-generational abuse family pods he was looking at some extraordinary things he was looking at what the results are of the psychological traumas sexual uh, abuse, as well as um, some extraordinary physical abuse by these families on their own children before the children were age five, before their brains had a chance to form. This was outside uh, most people's realm of understanding. It was outside of most people's realm of even um, knowledge, for that matter, because these groups were, were, were very secretive. They were, some of them uh, labeled themselves as uh, being engaged in witchcraft, others just um, blatant uh, Satanism, and they were incorporating blood traumas. They were incorporating food, water, sleep deprivation. But the most horrendous of them all were the parents of these children sexually abusing their own. A child doesn't, before age five, certainly doesn't relate to sex as any sort of a emotional uh, outlet of pleasure. A child who is, whose brain is not yet formed, who is being literally abused to the point of what the child thinks is death, before age five, begins to develop some extraordinary defense mechanisms. Dissociative identity disorder is what it's professionally labeled. At one time, they called it multiple personality disorder. Not too long ago, nothing could be farther from the truth. We only have one persona, one personality. That personality can be fragmented, it can be shattered, it can be professionally compartmentalized to where we have all sorts of projections of other personas, but basically there's only one personality. Well, this is what Adolf Hitler was interested in. Adolf Hitler was indeed the one individual who had the largest pool of human guinea pigs that's ever been known on this planet. The work that he was wanting to accomplish for his, quote, New World Order, George Bush and Clinton, everybody else who used the same term. Actually, they all stole it from Nero. What they were actually looking for was to understand from a clinical perspective how these offspring who were being sexually abused, psychologically abused, and physically abused, of course, were developing 44 times visual acuity. That's like having eyes in the back of your head. 44 times 
improved visual acuity. Well, now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, pardon the pun, to understand how this could be applied in special forces, how it could be applied to s soldiers who were in missions that a normal soldier could not possibly walk away from. These guys kid. These children had 44 times visual acuity improvement. They also had photographic memories. Now, everyone in this audience has got a photographic memory. Some of us just don't use the camera very often, but <laughs> nevertheless, we've all got it. I'm one of those folks, too. By the way, Kathy and I uh, don't prepare our presentations. I've never used notes, uh, except when somebody wants me to announce something. It's very easy to tell the truth over and over and over and over again. It's very easy to answer questions as long as you answer them truthfully. Well, that would have bothered Adolf Hitler quite a bit because he believed that the ultimate weapon would be the control of the minds of the people. And he didn't want people to be able to tell the truth or to know that they were lying. What he wanted was to be the puppet master for his New World Order's politicos that would control the various regions on this planet. I don't see that there's much difference in what Adolf Hitler planned in this New World Order scenario than what's going on right now. Jumping forward in time a bit, when Kathy and I first started out on this whistleblowing trail, we were told not to use the words mind control, call it behavioral modification. Well, that's what I had to call it when I worked for the intelligence community in the 60s and 70s. It wasn't called mind control wasn't referred to as mind control. It was referred to as behavioral modification. I didn't hear the words New World Order when I was working, but I was told when Kathy and I first started out that we couldn't use that term, that that was a conspiracy nonsense, there was no such thing. And then when George Bush stood up on television and said, this is um, the beginning of a New World Order, that was all I needed to hear. And then I heard the admiral in charge of SEAL Team 6 stand up on the Discovery Channel and say that he answered only to the President of the United States and the New World Order. That documentary is available. And I would like to be able to afford to at least have that clip and send it to all the people who said there was no such thing as New World Order. When, when Adolf Hitler began to research the findings and he began to apply some of these things on, on people, he began to understand the gravity of, of uh, if you control the person's mind, then you control everything. Freedom of thought is mankind's last remaining freedom, and it has been eroded seriously just in the last few decades, more seriously than ever before. It used to be that religions control the people in a type of what I call soft mind control. And then it became, if it was hard mind control, they called them cults. Now, all of us are subject to soft mind control. All of us have had it applied to us because our history books, for instance, have been changed. Our newspapers and our other forms of, of news and information are greatly spun and changed so that we do not get the truth. If we don't get the truth, but we think we're getting the truth, and we're predicating all of our th thoughts, our actions, upon what we learn, but what we're learning is controlled, contrived, 
This is mind control. This conference should be a hundred times the size that it is. It should be like a, one of these major football games or baseball games. But no, the people who think they're free and think that they have freedom of thought are tending those games by the tens of thousands. And guess what? <laughs> You guys are the ones that are actually enjoying the remnants of freedom of thought. And it is you all that are going to take some of this information away from this conference and you're going to spread it around. Kathy and I have never advertised our book, we've never solicited ourselves, and we have never allowed any group or organization to support us it has been a dreadful trek through hell. All because I happened to be in, in a very odd, unique situation at one point in my life. And I became privy to what Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler had worked so diligently on. There was a project that was born the same year as the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, which actually was just a, a changeover from the OSS. That was called Project Paperclip. Project Paperclip was the importation legally, legally, of Nazi and fascist scientists into this country. And most people would think, oh, it just, they were rocket scientists. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. There were about six or seven hundred odd propulsion scientists, engineers, like Werner von Braun and his team, that were brought over to the United States on this Project Paperclip that was sanctioned by Congress. Of course, Congress said, okay, you can bring over these, these people because we, if we don't contain these folks, our enemies, like the Soviet Union, and by the way, I never saw them as an enemy. I just saw them as people in a, literally in a, a race, a technology race with us. So Congress allowed the importation of these people to be put into our higher institutions of learning our, within our military industrial complex, within transportation, and within communications. And of course, they were brought in to build rockets. No, it didn't stop there because there were 600 odd psychiatrists and psychologists that had been engaged in mind control atrocities and mind control research for Adolf Hitler. The United States government deemed that so secret that in 1947, same year that Project Paperclip was born, the same year that the CIA was born, the same year Roswell occurred, I mean, 47 was a banner year. They launched the National Security Act. And that is what Kathy and I are all about. We want to see the repeal of the National Security Act because you folks are going to hear something right now that you're not going to like. There's not one person in this audience, not one, that could not legally be experimented on, killed, or financially destroyed, and you have no 
recourse legally. None. Zero. As long as the National Security Act is in place. The National Security Act has not guarded our nation's secrets very well either. The rules of ethical military conduct had done a remarkably good job for years and years and years. No problems. But the National Security Act came along and the string of, of espionage problems that occurred and the cover-ups that ensued is, is, is nonstop. And I'm going to tell you how that National Security Act has played in turning someone who used to be highly paid to keep his mouth shut, who now works for nothing, just enough to keep talking. Yeah. I was very fortunate. I did not have to go to Vietnam, get my head blown off, or wind up coming back home uh, as a headbanger. I was very fortunate. I didn't want to flee to Canada. I just simply wanted to serve my country in some capacity. And so I thought, well, um, uh, I was relating to some of the old World War II uh, ideas where women uh, were, were working in the factories, building airplanes and bombs. And I thought, well, you know, why can't I build something or do something other than go over there and get my head blown off? Well. I didn't have an appointment to West Point or, or, or anything that would keep me in, in university or, or college during that period of time. I was going to college, to Knight College. But I was given the opportunity to go to work for a company based right up the road in Redwood City called the Ampex Corporation. Ampex Corporation invented the instant replay. They had developed videotape and they were the foremost military industrial complex provider of the most extreme technologies in recording ever known to man. And I was given a job to keep me from being drafted by the Ampex Corporation as an engineer. Well, obviously, there are a lot of folks in here that know who I am. And by the way, we want to get to know who you are, so you've got the advantage on us. Come by and talk to us later. But those of you who know me know that I have trouble balancing the checkbook. I'm dyslexic. I couldn't be an engineer if my life depended on it. But I nevertheless had that title. What I did in the, in the mid-60s and late-60s and early-70s was I just was in charge of maintaining not the physical maintenance, I had an actual, real, honest-to-God engineer with me at all times. But I worked in mental institutions, both state and federal. I worked in the state and federal prison systems, worked on uh, NASA sites, and was working to just simply guard the integrity of certain file tapes and films. Those file tapes and films were on what it, we called behavioral modification projects. The scientists that I knew, some of them uh, admittedly were, were um, former admitted Nazis, but they were just doing what they liked to do. And what I saw them doing in the 60s and 70s, I truly believed then, and I truly believe it now was benevolent for society. You know, anything that could be used for positive can also be used for negative. A knife, for instance, is a, is a device that allows us to uh, uh, use it as a tool or a weapon. Mind control? The one I was seeing, the behavioral modification programs, particularly in the prison systems and in the, in the hospitals, the people were either incorrigible, they had extreme, I mean, we, we're talking the Charlie Manson types, 
They, these people had extreme social problems, to put it mildly. They had behavior problems. They were, some of them were cannibals. Some of them were serial killers. Some of them weren't any of those things, but they could not function in society. And what I was seeing were these people being free of those extreme mental bonds. People were recovering from the unrecoverable. People were becoming functional when they absolutely were non-functional. So myself and the scientists that I was rubbing elbows with, we all believed that this was one of the greatest opportunities for emptying out our prisons, for emptying out our mental institutions by the year 2000. We literally were working towards that goal. Sure, we would have a prison system, but they would actually be for rehabilitation rather than just caging people. I truly believe this because I never saw any trauma-based mind control or behavioral modification being applied. What I saw were benevolent. They used drugs, hypnosis, very mild electroshock, about like taking a nine volt battery and, you know, wetting a place on your arm or your leg and putting it on you. I mean, it, you can feel a little tingle, but it's not the electroshock that most of us equate where they're trying to treat schizophrenia and other things. I, there's, a, there's a huge body of evidence that says that electroshock therapy is just that. I, I, I strongly disagree. I have never seen it work for the benefit of the individual. And I didn't see any of that type of electroshock. What I did see, though, was people recovering. Now, the worst part about it was most of them could not be released. That was the only thing that I saw that, that really hurt me. They could not be released back into the populace because of their crimes that many of them had committed. And society would not allow that. And the government could not admit to these people being totally recovered. So unfortunately, these people remained incarcerated. Well, these scientists working on this project, by the way, it was the project name was officially born in 1953, some 64 months after the National Security Act was passed, when uh, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency became a funded organization, and when something landed in Roswell. <laughs> All of these things that were happening made me believe that mankind was e truly evolving. I recently was given what is known as a plum. Someone in Langley was kind enough to send me something that I was scared to even put on my computer. It was a set of four disks. These disks cover the MK Ultra projects, all of them, from 1953 until 1973. These disks contain 1.2 gigabyte of some 23,000 files. The names of the people who were being um, worked with, experimented on, were blacked out. That's all. The rest of the project information is there, believe it or not, intact. It's not redacted, for the most part. I hadn't even gotten through them, all the files. It would take me a year to read all that stuff. But I did find some extraordinary information in it. And Kathy and I are putting these things available. I, I only had a, about a dozen of them I could bring to this conference. A dozen copies. But we feel like what Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler were putting together to control the world 
if we, if we permit people to actually see for themselves what our government has now declassified and made available, we felt like that maybe, just maybe, that with enough voices, this situation can be reversed. I still believe this. I believe that the good guys outnumber the bad guys five to one. I could be a little bit off. could be the other way around. Because like I said, this has been a walk through hell because in, after I left the Ampex Corporation, I was recruited. And I won't take you through my entire employment history, but I worked for Laser Systems and Electronics as their medical sales manager. I was vice president of marketing and sales for Laser. Laser was the first, um, uh, that was a group of NASA scientists. These guys are paid off with technologies when they retire. And one of them was given some laser technology. And uh, he was the first man to bounce a laser off the moon. And um, he was also very interested in a device called, uh, that incorporated telemetry. Telemetry is the wireless transmission of something, whatever. In this case, it was uh, body functions, brain waves, heartbeat. And back in those days, uh, this was in the early 70s, they didn't have anything in the hospitals for cardiac patients who were recovering to monitor their heart unless they put them in a bed and they put all, run all these wires to them. Well, psychologically, that was killing more of them than, than it was actually helping. So this new telemetry device, about the size of a small package of cigarettes, could fit in the patient's pocket and the patient could go all over the hospital because there were antennas buried in the ceilings. When in fact, just a few years earlier, all that technology was classified, top secret. And then when NASA decided that they could help their position publicly, they released it. They don't release any technologies unless it feathers somebody's nest. What I was seeing in the 70s was 25 years of head of anything. Now I understand it's gone off the scale. I've had the luxury of meeting some extraordinary people, engineers, working within the military industrial complex at this time on experimental propulsions. It's not even experimental anymore. I've had the opportunity to, to discuss in depth some of the things that, uh, experiments that I was privy to to see what happened to them. Where, where, where did they go? How, did, how were they developed? And they too had been developed for decades. Because you see, after leaving Ampex and, and working my tenure with laser systems and electronics, oh, who by the way, pioneered brain implants. That's a, that's a really touchy subject with me. Most people hollering about um, they've got a brain implant for mind control. Well, first of all, they wouldn't know it. Second of all, they don't need to do that. I wish they did. I wish that was all they, I wish they really needed to do a surgical procedure to put one of these things in you, or in, at least inject it or something. But they don't need implants. They haven't needed implants since 1983. That's scary stuff when you consider the ramifications of what is now possible through compressed microwave and any number of other advanced technologies for controlling your thoughts, creating apathy, rage, can easily be done with what is known as the heart project. And it can be done over vast areas of the planet simultaneously. This is old Tesla technology that most of you folks in here I'm sure are aware of, but I'm also, um, hoping that you're aware that the HARP operations were shut down for a period of time during the Clinton administration 
and it r restarted in August of last year. And they're building these things all over the planet. This is a form of the type of mind control that Hitler hadn't even thought about. This is the worst. Because there is no shielding. You don't, you can't be a privileged person, person and, and avoid it. In the mid-70s, I was approached after I left laser systems and electronics by a fellow friend of mine who'd kind of been hanging around me for all my career. He always seemed to direct me in the right places and I always seemed to wind up with incredible professional job opportunities. And I told him that I could not ever work in a medical field because I don't like blood product and I sure don't like to see brains. And I couldn't stand it. I, I mean, I literally passed out in an operating room one time watching a simple brain surgery. They were treffening this boy's head. He had a pressure on his brain. And when they got that little drill in his head, the thing just blew out and splattered me. <laughs> that did it. I hit the floor. <laughs> and I didn't eat for several days. Thank God I wasn't fond of organ meat. <laughs> or I'd never been able to touch it again. But I did tell this friend of mine, I told him, I said, I, I, don't, I don't care what it is, I just don't want to deal with the medical profession. And I've got all these job offers from Johnson and Johnson and Codman and Shirtland, and the list goes on. I said, I can't handle it. I said, I don't care about the money, I just can't handle it. He said, well, um, what about transportation? So he said, well, I'll send you to a place called Smyrna, Tennessee. I said, that's the uh, only thing there is an old military base. He said, well, uh, that old military base is owned and operated now by the city but, uh, of Smyrna, which is a population then of about 1,200 people. He said, but um, the interesting thing is, he said, the world's largest supplemental airline is based there. And you know some of the people involved with that airline. I said, oh, sure, that's, that's capital. Capital, International Airways. Born in 1947. Hey, what a coincidence. Mm-hmm. And oddly enough, they were born in Virginia. Oh, boy. Well, I didn't really consider uh, anything other than the fact that they were a large supplemental airline. And, I was a marketing guy, so this would be a great opportunity, and I interviewed. And when I interviewed with the senior vice president and the president, uh, Mr. Jesse Stallings, um, I left there wondering what I had just interviewed for because they didn't outline my job description. They only were interested in how much money I wanted. That's it. And they wouldn't tell me what my job was going to be. And I didn't even know what I was interviewing for. They told me to show up for work Monday morning, and I did. They didn't even have an office for me. And so I, I politely asked Al Pittman what I'd be doing. <laughs> he said, you're going to be in charge of advertising. Oh, OK. That's a lot of money to pay an advertising manager. That's okay. He said, no, you're, you're, you're a director now, and you're, we're going to promote you to vice president. Of course, that's kind of like a bank. Everybody's a vice president in the airline business. If you're in upper management, everybody's a vice president. This is no great distinction. So I um, said, well, that's great. He said, well, I'll introduce you to your employees. Well, I work for Capital. And then one day, federal marshals descended upon the building. In 1976, I was um, going to Washington to a uh, big gala affair for the travel and tourism. Uh, Donna Tuttle, who was under secretary under Jimmy Carter, had invited me up, and I was uh, being honored for my contributions to 
U.S. travel and tourism. I thought it was kind of nice until the U.S. Marshals came in and they briefly asked me by holding up a paper clip, what did I know about this? Well, I'm not real slow, but I told them, I said, I don't, I use them every day. <laughs> I said, I got big ones, little ones, and I said, and I said, we've also got plastic ones. <laughs> well, oddly enough, he said, that's all I need to know. I thought, wow. <laughs> I had some friends of mine that were U.S. Marshals, um, and that was back in the days when all they did was transport prisoners. And I used to play poker with them. That's when I lived in Atlanta working for Ampex. So I, I knew where their hot buttons were and, and what to say and what not to say. And so I asked the guy, I said, this is not um, um, consistent with uh, the guy's level of intelligence. Why are you asking me about paper clips, man? Why don't you ask me about the real meat and potatoes, like my fountain pen? <laughs> I said, what, what is this all about? He said, you, 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 you're all need to know, and that's all you need to know. He said, you obviously don't know anything. I said, you got that. He said, we're going to put you in charge of the integrity of all the files in this building. I said, um, and, and why? What's going on? He said, there is a, um, a federal charge that's being levied against Capital International Airways and its executive officers that will have to be addressed in Congress because it's a matter of national security. Well putting me in charge of the integrity of those files was very much like handing or putting handcuffs on me and putting a big block of cheese and putting me in that, you know, in a little box with that big block of cheese and I'm handcuffed and you turn 15 rats loose and I'm supposed to guard that cheese? I knew I was going to go to prison and probably for the rest of my natural life that I'd been set up. Well, I went in and I expressed my opinion to my boss. He said, you don't have anything to worry about. I said, oh, yes, I do, because I happen to know that somebody just broke into one of the files, and they said that I'm going to prison. Whether I tell them or not, I'm still going to go to prison. He said, you're not going to say anything. And he said, uh, we hired you because you, you know how to keep your mouth shut. I said, well, I thought, I mean, kind of insulted. I said, I thought you hired me because of my abilities. He said, that too, but... You can keep a secret. I said, okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave this country. Can you keep a secret? <laughs> because I'm going to tell you where I'm going. And I'm going to steal one of your airplanes to go there. <laughs> he told me, he said, now wait a minute. Don't even start that kind of dialogue with me or something to that effect and berated me and berated me and, and he said, you wait out there in the, well, it was the boardroom actually attached to his office. I'm sitting there and my boss, Jesse Stallings, picks up the phone and calls a fellow by the name of Richard Nixon. Oh boy. I mean, this is really getting serious now. Really, really, really getting serious. I thought, well, life as I know it is over and I don't even know why. I left that office and he called me back up and he said, there's a U.S. Marshal coming out here to take the seals off all the files, it's over, forget about it. I thought, Jesus, all I got to do is get out of this company, I just, I, I got to get away from it. And I had people telling me all the time I work for the CIA. I said, of course I work for the CIA, you moron, Capital International Airways. I said, I don't, I don't work intelligence any, anymore because I started out with Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA. I said, I don't, I don't do that anymore. I work for Capitol. They said, well, okay, whatever you say, but you still work for the CIA. I said, how do you know? They said, because I work for the CIA. I said, well, I heard that many, many times, and I never believed it. Moving forward in time a bit, I had the opportunity to
to go into business for myself when I found out for, for a fact that I was working for the intelligence community and nobody leaves the intelligence community. It's like the mob. You don't just say goodbye. You don't just say I'm going to go and do something else. You have to go to work for yourself and you've got to make sure your customer base, whatever business or services you're providing, doesn't get put in one little corner with one large customer. I knew these things. So I decided I'd, I would get into my own business of consulting within the travel and tourism industries. I did very well at it. And I enjoyed myself very much until one day in 1986 I was contacted when I was living in Nashville, Tennessee by an old friend of mine I had severed communications with years previous because he and I had gone our separate ways. I thought he was a redneck. He owned a plumbing company and um, I just never, never really wanted to spend any time talking to him or being with him because he and I couldn't communicate anymore. We'd outgrown each other. He contacted me and he said, Mark, he said, um, I've been reading about you in the newspaper for years. Nashville Banner, Tennessee, and he said, I guess your daddy got you in there. I said, oh, no. No, my father worked for the newspaper. I said, no, actually, he, he was rather surprised that I got honored by anybody or anything. He said, uh, well, he said, uh, you're doing a lot of international business. I've got an opportunity for you. So he introduced me to a guy who was supposed to be a country music entertainer, MC, stage hypnotist, really sleazy dude by the name of Alex Houston. He was a ventriloquist. God, wouldn't you hate to be the dummy on his lap? Whew. Alex Houston was indeed one of the sleaziest people I've ever had the misfortune of knowing because I was taught neurolinguistics, the language of the unconscious, the language of the subconscious. And I also was taught handwriting analysis and graphology. I had all the tools of being able to determine whether or not someone was being honest with me, whether they were a threat to me, or whether I could do business with them. And Alex Houston was somebody I could do business with, but I had to maintain control. He had a great idea, which took me and him to Hong Kong. And we started a joint venture company with the People's Republic of China. We were building these giant capacitor banks for energy savings so that the Chinese mines wouldn't have to shut down. It was, it was at this juncture that I began to learn that I truly enjoyed what I had been doing, and that was negotiating international business deals. In three weeks, we put together $31 million worth of business with the Chinese. And I was, and with Alex Houston, 51% owners of a company called Uniphase Corporation. I had not, I didn't want to socialize with Alex Houston. I hadn't met his wife or his daughter. And then when I went back to China for the final deals and we were building a huge plant over there, 65,000 square foot plant to manufacture these capacitors, I was approached by a Chinese intelligence officer. Oh, I failed to mention that my partner in Hong Kong was a fellow by the name of William Yu and he was an arms dealer, major for the Chinese and he owned a ship line. He distributed silkworm missiles all over the world. He was a nice guy, in spite of his work, and I trusted him. So when I was approached by a Chinese intelligence officer, this was in 1987, and this guy told me that he needed to speak with me because there was a serious problem. I thought that serious problem was I was fixing to be thrown out of that company because now that they had literally all my knowledge and everything that they wanted, 
then they no longer had any need for me, but that was not to be the case. This Chinese intelligence officer began unfolding some things that I had never seen before. See, I was raised in an upper middle class family. Uh, some would call it wealthy. I wasn't familiar with incest. I wasn't familiar with horrific tortures and child abuse to that nature. My father was very abusive, but nothing to compare to what I would later learn. I knew a little bit about the Hein Heinrich Himmler studies and uh, uh, what had gone on in Nazi Germany with, with those uh, people. But I just didn't equate it as going on in the United States. And this Chinese intelligence officer began showing me my classified files, still classified, still classified. Now this really scared me because you got to remember, you can, you can take the boy out of the CIA, but you can't take the CIA out of the boy. And I was going to run straight home and tell, which I did. But let me tell you the rest of it. He also began impressing me with some of the most horrible stuff I had ever seen in my life. He explained to me that Alex Houston, my business partner, had to be removed from the company because he was involved in child pornography. White slavery. He just said slavery. And by the way, child pornography is uh, uh, punishable by death in China, first offense. A lot of things are, but they particularly don't like that one. He was also engaged working for the Central Intelligence Agency. This fellow had indeed shown me some of the most horrific stuff I can imagine. He showed me a picture of Alex Houston having sex with a small child. And that child turned out to be Haitian. He explained to me that I had to get rid of Alex Houston. I said, fine, I would. So I did. I went back to the States, and I told the Chinese if they were sincere, they'd give me the money to buy him out. They did. And I bought him out. And I went to see some friends of mine. Because this white slavery thing had other words like mind control attached to it. And he also told me, this Chinese intelligence officer, that Alex Houston was engaged in money laundering and illicit drugs, and it went all the way to the White House. I went back and began quizzing some old friends in the intelligence community who were still active, and they validated it for me. Well, I. At this time, by this time, I'd met Kathy and her daughter. I mean, we're talking a major airhead. Major. And by the way, no one escapes mind control. That's called abuse. Lots of people escape abuse. Mind control is just that. It's mind control. You don't know that you're being controlled. Of course, Kathy didn't even know her own name. She didn't know how old she was. She didn't know where she'd been in her travels. So I was convinced that I would get them out and get them into therapy and go back to China and do my thing. So I asked some people that knew, and they gave me codes, keys, and triggers. I applied them. They worked. I got her out, her and her daughter. And guess what? Everything in my life flipped upside down. All my bank accounts were gone. Everything that I had, gone. And I, they did the stupidest thing. They threatened me. And they had the sheriff of my county, who was a friend of mine, to deliver it. And he told me, he said, Mark, he said, this is a CIA crap. He said, I would strongly recommend you just walk away from this right now. Well, I convinced him that I had lost my mind, and I walked away from it by taking Kathy and her daughter to Alaska. 
that same organization that was responsible for her victimization. I knew good people were in there. They provided me the technological antidote because I was certainly not in any position to deprogram anybody. I'd seen it done, but I, I didn't know how to do it and didn't pay that close attention. So I had to do it. And as a result of that, you're going to hear probably the most incredible validated story that is going to soon be a major theme in maybe more than one motion picture and a TV series, documentary series. After all these years, Kathy and I believe that this is our last year. And now I would like to bring up the person who is responsible for turning my life around. I wasn't ever a bad guy, but I, I truly believed a bunch of things that weren't true. And now I know the truth, and now you will as well. If you'd please welcome the love of my life. Nancy?